Well, good morning, church. Welcome. I want to welcome everyone, especially those who are new to the church in person or maybe you're tuning in for the first time. Welcome. My name is Greg, uh, just one of the pastors here, or you could always call me Pastor Gary, as everybody uh, often does. But uh, welcome to the church. And uh, as you might have heard, we are in this series called 40 Days of Prayer. I just really pray that your prayer life has been enhanced, enriched, empowered uh, by this time of prayer together as a church family. You know, the last time I spoke, I was up here and sharing from Matthew chapter 7 and how Jesus taught us to ask, seek, and knock when we pray. And if you were here for that message, I shared about my daughter, Karis, who for nearly half her life, for the past four years, she has been asking and knocking on our hearts, asking for a small furry pet. She gave us options, either a puppy or a bunny, either will do. And we've had conversations over and over and over again. And in, in that message, I shared with you how finally... Uh, Monica and I decided that we would get her that bunny. Now, since that message a couple weeks ago, I cannot tell you how many conversations, how many texts, how many pictures, how many videos I've had sent from you people in this church who are obviously bunny lovers. I didn't know we had so many bunny lovers in this church. If anybody found my phone, they would think I was a creepy bunny addict, and I am just not. I'm not. But the number one question that everybody's been asking is, so, did she get her bunny? Did you get her her bunny? Well, I'm happy to share with you that as of yesterday, yesterday we brought home our little bunny, Cinnabon. <laughs> ah, <it's okay. laughs> That's Cinnabon. Well, I, he, I have to admit, he's pretty darn cute. I almost brought him to church this morning. He's pretty cute, all right? But in that message, I shared about how sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers right away, or he doesn't always answer exactly how we ask. And that's the sovereignty of God, because he's good and there's something better he has in store for us. Today, I want to talk about other reasons why God may not answer, right away or not at all. And so I'm going to call this message, Why God Doesn't Answer, Why God Doesn't Answer, and before we uh, pray, before we get into the word, I want us to pray and spend some time in prayer. And as we pray, I want to ask you to intercede, uh, in particular for our friends in Ukraine, our neighbors in Ukraine. We have particular friends, uh, Pastor Igor and his wife Lena, that you guys have met. Uh, they've been here on this stage, and we've heard this past week that there's possibly 300,000 if not possibly 500,000 troops from Russia on the borders ready for an attack and an offensive at any moment now as we near the one-year anniversary of when that war started. Okay, so let's spend some time to pause and just pray that God would protect them, all right? So would you join me? Let's bow our heads and come before the Lord. God, we bow our heads before a sovereign king, and we acknowledge that you are king over all. You're king of kings and lord of lords, and the whole universe is in your hands. Lord, we know that includes Ukraine. And so, Lord, right now we pray in Jesus' name that you would protect your people there, that you would protect innocent people from, from harm, Lord. I think about the story of Elisha, and when the army came up against Elisha, and you sent a heavenly host, an angelic army to surround him, a number that was greater than those who surrounded him. And I pray that you would do the same, Lord, that you would protect, especially those who are there to proclaim your name, like our friends, Pastor Igor and Lena, who are there to preach the gospel, make known the life that comes through Jesus Christ. God, would you allow them to continue to minister and sustain their ministry, Lord, that these threats would have no bearing, Lord, that it would have no impact on what they're doing for the gospel there, God. So protect them against the enemy. Lord, we pray that same prayer for us as we get into your word. Protect us because we know there's a real enemy who would love to attack at any moment, especially in the times when we're coming before you to learn your truth. So, God, would you protect our hearts and our minds, physically protect us from distraction, 
or harm. May we be able to be fully present here to hear from your spirit. So teach us your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We all say, amen, amen. So when it comes to prayer, we always want to open the Bible and search the scriptures to inform uh, the way we pray, to help us to pray in a way that is godly. And I want to encourage you to look to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is one of the most beautiful book full of Psalms and prayers. And I want to show you one of the most beautiful prayers in the book of Psalms, in my opinion. It's a prayer of David from Psalm 139. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 139. And I know a lot of you know Psalm 139. You've memorized some parts of it, but, but not a lot of us know this part of the prayer. Here, let, me, let me read it to you. It comes in verses 19 through 22. Such a beautiful prayer, and it goes kind of like this. David prays, and he says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. That you would speak against, they speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Hmm, isn't that lovely? That's a lovely prayer, isn't it? It's like, what in the world is that? That's David, the man after God's own heart. The man who who is a man of God, and yet he prays a prayer like that? How can such words come out of his mouth in a prayer to God? Let me ask you, do you think God always answers everything that David asks for? See, here's something David understood himself in Psalm 66. In another psalm, he wrote this. He wrote in verse 18, he says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And so he recognizes that there are times and situations in which the Lord will not hear or listen to my prayers, specifically when there is sin in my heart that lingers there. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you some explicit scriptures that say there are times when God may not answer our prayers. So the first one is in James chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, open it or turn to your app, James chapter 1. And here's what he says about prayer. Verse 6. He says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So if you're taking notes, um, I want to encourage you to write this down. Number one, Here's the first reason God may not answer your prayers. God may not answer when our faith is absent. God may not answer when our faith is absent. Think about how we often pray, right? When you pray, what's that phrase we say at the end, right before we say amen? What do we say? In Jesus' name we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, what what does it mean? Have you ever thought, what do we mean by in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus? What does that mean? Well, in in the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul was doing crazy ministry, like a powerful ministry. The sick were being set free. Demoniacs were being delivered in the name of Jesus. And Paul's ministry was so powerful that all these Jews saw what Paul was doing, and they wanted to copy him. They wanted to mimic him because they were envious of his powerful ministry. And so they start trying to say, in the name of Jesus, just like Paul did. Now, here's what happened when these Jews, known as the sons of Sceva, started mimicking Paul. Verse uh, 13 through 16. This is Acts chapter 19. It says that some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Right? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. 
Now, what in the world happened there? They, they find a person demon-possessed. They want to cast out that demon, just like Paul does so easily. And so they say, in the name of Jesus. And yet, when Paul is able to deliver the demoniac, this demoniac beats them up and leaves them bleeding. Why didn't it work for them? Why didn't it work? They said the name of Jesus. Well, I'll tell you why. Because all they had was a phrase, but they had no faith. All they had was a phrase, but they had no faith. The only faith they had was in a saying, but they had no faith in the Savior. It was like a magical phrase, an incantation. If we just say these words, there should be power in it. Yet they did not trust in the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And that's the difference. See, I pray that when we pray, And we pray in the name of Jesus that we pray with faith that he has power and authority to actually answer. That he is greater than anyone or anything in the world. That when we pray in the name of Jesus, that requires us to believe that Jesus has authority and power to hear, to listen, and to act. And if we pray... And we're absent of faith, and we say in the name of Jesus, absent of faith, then that prayer is just as powerful as the sons of Sceva. No power at all. Empty of power. So we pray in the name of Jesus, believing that he has power and authority, power power enough to move mountains. Do you believe that? Do you believe he can Here's what Jesus says when he teaches about prayer in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 24. What does he teach? He says, have faith in God. Have faith. How do you apply that? Well, he goes on. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. Have faith that you received it, and it will be yours. So the challenge for each one of us as we pray is how much do you have faith in the God you pray to? Because I read this, and Jesus is straightforward here, very straightforward. Believe, have faith that it will happen, it will be done. Now, I have to admit, this is a very hard teaching, for me at least. This is very hard. It's not hard because it's hard to understand. In fact, it's quite simple to understand. Just believe, and it'll happen. But what makes it hard is it almost seems too simple. It's like I I, want to, like, say to Jesus, Jesus, you're kidding, right? Like, there's more. You don't really mean that, do you? Like, this is hyperbole, you're being exaggerative. Like, it's not that simple, is it, right? There's a different understanding of your teaching, right, Jesus? And it's like, I find myself trying to come up with some alternative interpretation of what Jesus meant by just believe it'll happen and it'll be done for you, as if I'm trying to protect Jesus or defend him. From what? From my own heart. So that I don't get angry at him or I don't lash out at him or frustrated when my prayer doesn't get answered. And I'm wondering if my desire to want to defend Jesus is really me trying to defend my own doubt. Trying to defend my own unbelief. Because reality is I look back on my life and I realize there are times in my life when I've prayed with doubt. And faith was absent. Do you ever pray and throw out prayers to God, but in your heart of hearts, back in your head, you're like, it's not going to happen. I've thought about people I prayed for, praying that they would be saved, that they would find Jesus. And I'd give it to God, but in the back of my head, I'm like, "But, but it'll never happen. They're so far from God. There have been times when when we were trying to look for a house and we we put in a bid and God, please let us get this house. And there's 25 people placing offers as well. And in my heart, it's like, we're not going to get it. But God, would you help us get it? But we're not really going to get it. Do you ever pray with doubt? And then I look back on my life, and there are times when I could tell you with all sincerity, I believed. Like, I truly believed God was going to answer. 
couple weeks ago, I, I shared with you how there was going to be that Foster the City interest meeting. And I was praying that God would move in five people in our church to attend that interest meeting because foster care is a big deal. And then I changed that prayer from, God, not five people. I'm praying for 100 people to show up to that meeting. And I knew that was outrageous. Foster the City said they'd never had that kind of turnout. Not, no meeting's ever been that big. But, but, I, but I knew with absolute confidence in my heart God was going to do it. Like, seriously, I wish you could look into my heart during that time. I believed he was going to move in at least 100 people. That's why I shared it with so many people. That's why I invited so many people to pray because I just knew he would. And so when they told me after the event that 102 people showed up, my reaction, I wasn't like, oh, my gosh. What? Like, who are you? You actually, I, I didn't flip out. My honest reaction when I heard that 102 people showed up, my honest reaction was, yeah, I knew it. I knew he would. I knew he's good. He's God. And there's just this faith that he was going to do just as I asked. When you pray, do you have faith in the God you're asking? I shared also in that message that I had a surf injury and I was being convicted through that teaching on asking, seeking, and knocking to pray yet again that God would heal my hearing. In 2018, a surfboard flew into my ear, this ear right here, and it ruptured my eardrum. It got infected, and my hearing has never been the same since that day. It rings 24-7. As I'm speaking to you, it's still ringing. I can't hear certain frequencies. And since then, I've gone to at least five ENTs, ear, nose, throat doctors. I've taken more than five audiology tests. I've gone to many hearing aid specialists to see if that would help. And you know what they've all said to me? They've all agreed, and they've all told me the same thing. Nothing can be done to bring your hearing back. Because they said it's neural. It, it, my nerves are damaged. There's no surgery that could repair damaged nerves, right? So they're like, nothing can be done. And one doctor told me, nothing short of a miracle from God. So since that last message, I started praying again. You know what? I'm going to ask because I believe he could do miracles. He could move mountains. And so I, I've, I've been praying. And then this past Monday, I got a recommendation from someone to go to this one particular ENT doctor in Santa Monica, highly recommended. And so I looked up the reviews, very good reviews. So I made an appointment on Monday. I went in, drove to Santa Monica, and I, I sit there, and guess what happens 14 minutes into my meeting with him? 14 minutes. Guess what happens to my hearing? You know what happened? Huh? <laughs> what? No, seriously, I can't hear you. Did you did anyone say anything? I, nothing happened to my hearing. After that meeting, it was an, a long meeting, nothing happened to my hearing. You know what he said to me? He, he heard what I had to share, and he just concluded, nothing is going to bring your hearing back. There's nothing I can do. And I joked with him. I said, I've heard that before, nothing short of a miracle from God, huh? And here's what he said back to me. He joked back. He said, not even a miracle of God is going to bring your hearing back. That's what he said. <laughs> but he's a good doctor. I would recommend him to you. If you need an ear doctor, let me know. I'd recommend him. I'm going to go back for a surgery with him. But I want to say to you, church, I believe with all my heart that he's going to heal my hearing. I really believe it with absolute confidence. And I'm not just saying this just to make a point because this is what we're preaching on. I really believe he's going to heal my hearing. I don't know when he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. And I can't wait to the day I stand on this stage and I tell you, church, I can hear you now. Right? I can't wait to celebrate that testimony with you. I believe that God will do it. I want to challenge you. Will you pray with faith? And when you ask in the name of Jesus, believe in the authority and the power of the Jesus who is in you. But it's not just believing that the mountains will move. It's believing in the mountain mover. It's not just having, it's not positive thinking. It's not just believing in what you're asking. It's believing in the one you are asking. It's Jesus. And so like Jesus says, have faith in God. 
Have faith in the power of the name of Jesus. Okay, so that's the first reason why God may not answer if our prayers are absent of faith. That's the first one. Let me show you number two. God may not answer, write this down if you're taking notes, when our motives are wrong. God may not answer when our motives are wrong. See, James, who told us to pray with faith, goes on a few chapters later in James 4. So flip to James chapter 4. And in verse 2, he says this. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. Well, the question is, what if I've been asking and I haven't been receiving? Well, I'm glad you asked. He anticipated that. And in verse 3, the next verse, he says, you ask and do not receive. Why? Because you ask with the wrong motives. You ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. So, so what if I just believe I'm going to pray today for $10 million to fall into my lap today, and I believe it's going to happen. I just have confidence. Will it necessarily happen? Well, here's another requirement. What are your motives? Is it for your own pleasure, or is it for God's pleasure? Right? We go back to this idea of praying in the name of Jesus that requires faith. That he has power and authority, but also understand when we pray in the name of Jesus, what are we doing? We're praying according to his will and his desires. That's what it means to pray in his name. Here's what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. He says, when we pray, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And in another teaching of 1 John, he says, whatever you pray according to my will, the Father will hear and it will be done for you. And so to pray in the name of Jesus is to pray according to his will and his pleasures. So think about it like this. If I were an ambassador for my country and I go to another country, I'm an ambassador for my king. I'm going in my king's name. And I go to this other country and I say what the king tells me to say and I give the gifts the king gives me to, get, to, to give. What am I doing? I'm representing my king. I'm going in his name. And so everything I say as an ambassador, everything I do, everything I give is as the king would say and as the king is giving. I'm going in his name. I'm simply representing him. And in the same way, when we pray in the name of our king, Jesus, we're praying as he would pray. We're praying according to his will, according to his desires. What does he want? I'm going to pray in his name. Praying as Jesus would pray. So oftentimes when we pray, right, what does it sound like? It sounds a lot like this. It sounds like, please, God. Please, God, please grow my ministry. God, please give me a beautiful spouse. God, please raise my salary. God, please give me greater influence for you. And so often we're asking, please, God, please. Now let me ask you, how do we know if what we're asking for has wrong motives or right motives? How do we know if your motives, motive is right or wrong? Can I challenge you to do one thing? When you ask, please, God, do this one thing. Drop the comma. Drop the comma. And does that change the aim of your prayer at all? Does your please, God, aim to please God? Because if it does, that's a good motive. That's a good, it's not on your pleasures. It's for his. I was uh, reading a book called What Are You Going to Do With Your Life by Pastor J.D. Greer. And this one part really stuck, stuck out to me. He said, as a young pastor, he was really praying for the lost to be reached. And he's praying that his church would be full of people, that his church would grow. And he's really ambitious as this young pastor. And, and he says one Friday uh, afternoon, he was praying for that very thing. He says, that's a win-win situation. I, I want this church to grow, and I'm sure God wants that too. That's win-win. And so he's praying specifically, God, would you bring revival through our city, city of Raleigh, North Carolina. 
God, would you sweep this place with your spirit? Would many people, many lost come to find Jesus? God, may it be such a revival that it goes down into history books as one of the greatest revivals to take place that for generation after generation, they would remember what you did in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he says, as he's praying that Friday, the Lord impressed something so heavy on his heart that he said it left him speechless. It's as if God were saying to me, J.D., what if I were to sweep through your city and reshape the entire place? And thousands will come to know the truth of the gospel and be saved. And this will be surely written down in the history books, and people will remember what I did in Raleigh, North Carolina. But what if, J.D., what if I did it beyond what you can ask or imagine through the church down the street, through the pastor of that church? And what if their church blows up and their seats are filled with lost people and yours doesn't? And what if that pastor becomes the, the face of the movement and you don't? What if this is written in history books for generations, but your church and your name is never mentioned? Are you okay with that? He says, oh, he says, I know the church answer. Oh, that you must increase and I must decrease. That you must become greater, I must become less. He says, I know the church answer, I'm a pastor. He says, but in that moment, my motive was being revealed by my God. That all this time it's been about may, not may thy kingdom come, but may my kingdom come. And God was revealing the awful motive of his heart. What's your motive? Even if our prayers seem to be for God and they seem good, God sees the depths of our heart. And he may not answer if he sees that you're pleased, God primarily aims to please you and so drop the comma and then ask ask yourself a couple questions really practically when you're asking please God and you're asking for something in your life some breakthrough ask yourself how will the answer to this prayer bring pleasure to me how will the answer to this prayer bring pleasure and be honest about that that's okay it's okay to pray for our pleasures But then follow it up with the second question. How then would the answer to this prayer bring pleasure to God? How would it, and and be honest with that. And God can answer prayers that please both you and him. God will answer according to his goodness and sovereignty. God is God. But if you find a pattern that over time you're praying these prayers that only please you and never aim to please God, then don't be surprised if God does not answer. God may not answer when our motives are wrong. So those are two ways the Bible tells us explicitly our prayers may be hindered. When our faith is absent, when our motives are wrong. Let me give you one more before we end today. Number three, uh, write this down if you're taking notes. God may not answer when our relationships aren't right. God may not answer when our relationships aren't right. So let me show you straight out of scripture, all right? First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Turn to first Peter chapter three, verse seven. Here's what he says. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Another version will say in a considerate way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, treat your wives in a considerate and understanding way. And all the women say, amen, right? (laughs) Now, before anyone starts to get worked up or riled up, because the Bible, Peter just called the woman the weaker vessel. Hold on really quick. Let me just explain to you that Peter is not saying that women are lesser vessels. That's not what he's saying. Like when it comes to value and worth, in fact, in the same breath, right there in that verse, he said, we are co-heirs of the grace that God gives us. There's no discrimination between men or women. The blood covers all. Equal value, equal worth. In fact, the, the picture of treating something as a weaker vessel actually gives attention to 
the vessel's value and its worth. It's this picture of treating it with delicate care, with love and tenderness. It's kind of like this. In my house, I have some cups that I like to use, like this one. I like this one. It keeps my drinks cold or keeps it hot, right? I, I really appreciate this one. And, and so, like, I, I could, it's tough. I could bring it anywhere I want, and I don't, I don't give too much, too much attention to it. And yet, there's another cup in my house we love to use, and it's this one. And this one um, is one of those special cups where uh, between the inner glass and the outer glass is hollow because you could then put hot beverages in it, and it's not going to burn your hands. I really like this one. But with this one, I'm not going to just chuck it into the sink to be washed or chuck it into the dishwasher because it's, it's delicate. I treat this one with careful attention. I'm considering how I use this one, being considerate. Why? Not because it's lesser, but because of its value to me, because of its worth to me. And so husbands, treat your wife with considerate care in an understanding way. Now, why, why does he call her the weaker vessel? Well, let's, let's just do some context here. In that day, in that culture, it was true as a fact that women were in a weaker position socially and culturally. They didn't get to share the privileges and advantages that a man does. So easily overpowered or taken advantage of. That's a fact. It's also true, generally true, that women just aren't built physically like men. Women generally aren't as strong or built like men. Now, is that always true? No, it's not always true. I know women in this church, ladies in the church, who would crush their husbands in an arm wrestling match or throw a football much further than their guy. Amen? <laughs> Some of you guys. But that's an exception, not the rule. I mean, Cheryl will crush Pastor Gary one-on-one -on -one in basketball. I, I promise you that. But that's an exception, not the rule. But when there's a possibility that the woman could be overpowered and taken advantage of by the man, here's the bottom line. God wants husbands to be understanding and considerate of their wives. Who's this speaking to? I pray that this church is full of men who are prayer warriors. I pray that this church is full of men who pray, who get on their knees, men who come to our prayer meetings on Tuesday night. I love seeing men here in this worship center, 6 a.m. on Thursday, praying. Some of them on their knees praying, crying out to God. I pray that we would be a church filled with men along with the women who pray. But Ben, let me speak to you really quick. Let me ask you, are you honoring your wives? Do you speak to her with words that are considerate, that are respectful, that are humble? Are you listening to her with a humble heart, with a willingness to consider what she's saying? Are you listening with receptive ears? And trust me, when I say men, I'm speaking to you. I'm telling you, God is speaking to me. He's been speaking to me all week. We're in this together. And so understand that this matters to God. It matters to God so much so that God may not answer and our prayers may be hindered if we're not doing as the Bible says. This matters to God. He's serious about this. Our relationships ought to be right. And this isn't just between husband and wife. This is also between brother and sister, sister and brother, brother and brother. God is serious about this. I mean, think about this. What is our, our purpose on earth? What's the, our highest priority? What's, what's our highest priority? Is it not to glorify God? Is it not to worship him? I mean, the chief end of man is to glorify God, is it not? God wants our worship, and yet it's crazy to me to think that there is a time when God doesn't want your worship. There's a circumstance in which he says, don't worship me right now. Look at what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Jesus says this. He says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar, 
right? You're coming to worship him, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. There is a time when God looks at your heart and says, don't even do this right now. I don't want your gift. You have beef with your brother. You got stuff with your sister. Go and make it right. Then come and worship me. Why would God halt our worship? Well, if you think about it, it just doesn't make sense that we would come to to offer our gifts and say, God, you are so worthy. You're worthy of our worship. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness and your love. How can we say that's meaningful to us when we're unwilling to go and show grace, mercy, and love? It doesn't make any sense. God, we love you for your gospel, your gospel of grace. And yet, not willing to live out that gospel of grace. That makes no sense to me. It's hypocritical. So don't, don't do this right now. Don't worship me in this way. That's not true worship. Go worship me out there. Go and offer grace. Go live out the gospel. Worship me like that. Then come and bring your gift. So this matters to God. Whenever I preach, I'm constantly praying. I'm asking, this is my please, God, please bless this message. Please use me, God, please speak to your people. Always praying that. And yet as I'm asking that, there are times when right before I'm about to preach the word of God, like my wife and I will get into this argument. It's terrible, the timing of this. It's always when I'm about to preach or teach the word of God, which is often, right? So we get into these arguments, and based on Matthew chapter 5, I know I can't offer my gift to God's bride if I'm not right with mine. Like, how is it that unholy words and unholy comments and unholy tones are coming out from my mouth to my bride when holy words and holy scriptures are supposed to come out of my my mouth to God's bride? It should not be so. And based on Matthew 5, I know it's not right. It's terrible, the timing. Sometimes I believe it's spiritual attack. I'm like, there's a real enemy who wants to mess with my message by messing with my marriage. Sometimes it's spiritual attack. Other times I'm convinced it's because my wife is such a sinner. (laughs) But I'm patient with her, right? I'm patient with her. No, the sinner, honestly, I know is right here. And I know from Matthew chapter 5, if I have unaddressed and unconfessed sins and my relationships are not reconciled, it can hinder my relationship with God. And I should not expect him to listen. I'm conscious that if my relationships are right, my prayers may be hindered. Therefore, Mark 11, 25, he says to us, and when you stand praying, If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And when your sins are dealt with and they are addressed and it's not lingering there anymore, then I believe the ears of God are wide open. So who am I speaking to? Maybe you've been praying for healing for a long time now. Maybe you've been praying for a relationship. Maybe you've been praying for a breakthrough at work or at home. Maybe a breakthrough in school, and it just seems like heaven's been so silent. Why is nothing happening? It's possible that the very thing that's hindering your prayers is relational sin that's standing in the way, and God's graciously getting your attention. Deal with this and make it right. Maybe it's relational sin. Maybe it's any any sin. Is it possible? Is unaddressed sin? I want to make this clear. Is unaddressed sin always the reason why God doesn't answer? No. It's not always the the reason why. It's not always the cause of unanswered prayers. On the flip side, can God answer us even though we're sinning and living in sin? Can he answer those prayers? Yes. Why? Because he's God. And God will do what God does. He will do whatever he wants to do. There are times when you don't deserve it and he'll answer you. 
What, what do we call that? We have a word for that. It's called grace. When you don't deserve it and he's still good, that's called grace. He's full of it. He's full of grace. So God will do what he pleases to do. Let God do God, and it will always be good. But you do what you've been instructed to do, what I've been instructed to do. And the Bible makes it very clear to us. Here's what we know. Husbands, treat your wife right. Brothers, treat your sister and brother right. Sisters, treat your sister and brother right. Get right with each other. And if for any reason God seems silent, We may not know the exact reason, but may it serve as a healthy reminder to us to search our hearts and confess any sin that might be lingering in our hearts and address it with the grace of God. Let me close with this. I want to bring you back to that prayer. Remember that prayer, Psalm 139? When David prays, oh God, that you may slay the wicked. I hate those who hate you. And he's going at it. In this prayer, how could this come from the mouth of David, a man after God's own heart, a man who chased after God's heart? How could this prayer come out of his mouth? Well, the fact that he was pursuing God's heart tells me he hadn't arrived yet. At the time of this prayer, I'm sure he hadn't arrived. There are times when he fell short, and there's times when he's going to be sitting in his heart. But let me show you why I love this prayer, why it's so beautiful. Because of how he ends the prayer. Here's the next two things out of his mouth. Verse 23 and 24. He says this, but search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, I want these evil people punished. I think I'm right in this. They hate you, so I hate them. This is indignance. This is righteous anger. I'm right, right, God, but... But search me. Try me. Know my heart. If there's anything grievous to you, if there's anything offensive, if there's anything hurtful I'm not aware of, let me know. And if there is, then lead me in the right way. Lead me in the way everlasting. God, know my heart and make me right. And that's the kind of prayer I believe the Lord loves to hear and answer. Amen?